So this is the Canary Collective podcast and it's going to be an informal one that none of the others were very formal, but I'm Kaylee Pruitt-Ham and I'm here with Sarah Ramey, who, is that how you say your name? Um, who has published a book last year in 2020, A Lady's Handbook to Her Mysterious Illness. Is that what that's called? <laughs> um, and I just, we were introduced by a mutual friend, um, Phil, Philip Rogers, um, who is one of the many people that I get every week messaging me saying, hey, I have a mutual friend and their illness story reminds me a lot of yours. Like maybe you should talk. And usually I'm like, yeah, a lot of people are like, it's such a coincidence. Like, yes. oh my God, <laughs> you have this rare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are the odds? And I'm like, oh, the odds are pretty high. Like there are a lot of us out there. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, the same. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I just I think that we have we do have like an uncanny amount of parallels on many levels now that I've read or excerpts from your book and read more about you so just wanted to record this conversation but this is our first conversation um so <laughs> yes you have obviously met a lot of womies as you call them yeah. um and um, you know, say what uh, that means that's a, a woman with a mysterious illness it's a it's an imperfect acronym and uh, and then there's of course men with mysterious illnesses or a person with mysterious illnesses i just needed a term that refers to this family of pretty easily identifiable comorbid illnesses like chronic fatigue syndrome or me um fibromyalgia lyme pots multiple chemical sensitivity mast cell activation this is like autoimmunity. These are sort of ehlers danlos and I can like, <laughs> there's a whole bunch. Um, it's quite common to have uh, multiples of those or have multiple diagnoses from that list I just mentioned. And there's, but there's no parent term. <laughs> there's no word for, you know, there's a lot of different types of cancer, for example, but, you know, we just call it cancer and, and then you specify which type you have. Yeah. I think the same is probably going to be the, the case here is that these are neuroimmune endocrine problems with a gastrointestinal component that, uh, that are pretty recognizable and predictable once you're familiar with, with them and with sort of the, the common presentations and the spectrum of severity. It, it all starts to look the the opposite of the way that it looks in the beginning, which is completely mysterious. You go to doctor, 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 and they all, you know, either tell you that you're you're crazy or that you're actually quite healthy despite everything that you just said, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. There's a million versions of sort of rejection of what you're saying, and and that's not true. Once you're in this world for quite a while, I'm sure you experience this. That you, <laughs> it's it is the opposite of being like a chin scratcher. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I could tell you probably some of the things that are wrong with you and, or that you know, you're experiencing physically and also what the journey has looked like in broad strokes of trying to find medical care and medical attention. It's very, very similar person to person. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I kind of mentioned uh, pretty much every episode on my podcast because I'm obsessed with Aaron Brockovich, but I, I mm -hmm. think it's really important to make some ties and like point out parallels of kind of a phenomenon of gaslighting that has been occurring in healthcare and doctor's offices all around the country and all around the world. Um, but it's kind of been a similar experience. Like when you watch the movie or of Aaron Brockovich with Julia Roberts playing her you you see her like also having the experience of like encountering these people who like it, you know what that reminds me of your neighbor who was just saying that their son has leukemia and like the, mm -hmm. you're reminding me of you know the superintendent of the school who was just diagnosed with um Crohn's disease and mm -hmm. oh and then 
that person has a chronic cough and they're all going into doctor's offices being told that their thing is a fluke and that their thing is unique and isolated and rare and and that you would be crazy to try to draw connections that aren't there mm -hmm. so the point of my podcast is not necessarily to say that all of our illnesses are because of an environmental toxin or anything like it was in the case of Hinkley, California, but to just say, maybe we are not so alone and maybe we're not so rare. And I think that's the point of your book. Yeah, right? that's right. And it's so important because I think one of the, the worst parts of this is the, this is changing, I would say in the last like five years, I've really noticed a difference in terms of the emergence of real communities and podcasts and an online like space for this type of illness, or I would say just chronic illness in general, but, but particularly these illnesses that just didn't have a home <laughs> before. There's no support because it's one thing, I always say this, it's one thing to be sick. It is another thing to be told that you are not sick, to be gaslit, to be told that there's that there's it's not even that you have a psychological problem because it's one I always say I'm like because if they're suggesting it's a psychological problem I'm like that's fine as long as like there's some treatment that would actually help with it, it you know it, it doesn't bother me what the diagnosis because I I entertained that in the beginning I was like that's fine I'm happy to be depressed if that's what you <laughs> I but I don't I mean it doesn't make sense to me I don't feel I feel upset that I'm sick, but I don't feel like I'm depressed and that's what's manifesting. But regardless, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. You're a doctor. And so I'll do whatever you say. But so what I was going to say though, is like to be sick and to have no support, no palliative care, no community, no, all of the things sort of like the, the apparatus around illness that really exists for basically every other illness to not have that is really bad and <laughs> devastating if you're the patient because it just makes you feel so alone and and it really the thing that has like been the worst for me that's like been the, the hardest to like deprogram is like is not believing that is like letting that into my own psyche and then at, and then, you know, not that long into it, a couple of years into it, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I think, I don't think I'm crazy. I think all of these people are wrong. Oops, my phone. Yeah, and they're missing something. Yeah, and then I went, you know, I'm sure as you have like very deep into the research and to like really try to figure it out for myself. And I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> not only are they wrong about this, like the data, is on my side, <laughs> not yeah. on their side. It's just hasn't, the data hasn't trickled down into medical practice yet. But that's, that that to me is so crazy that there can be so much overwhelming data that, that shows very clearly like this is, these are real physiologic illnesses um, that, that are not psychosomatic and that that, and that it's still incredibly common for, for doctors to just have that that prejudice and to treat you that way. And it's incredibly abusive. And, but, cause you would never do that for any other type of serious patient. I mean, you would have your medical license taken away from you. If your cancer patient comes in and you're like, oh, you silly, stop reading about quote cancer online. You know, what's actually going on here is you're depressed and I'm gonna treat you for that. Like you yeah. can't do that. You have to, if you don't know what it is you don't get to just make up <laughs> that it's you know, you don't get to just push it back off onto the patient. You have to say, oh, I don't know. And then be on the lookout for other doctors who are saying, oh, I don't know either. And then it, within medicine, it's up to them to do the research that you and I and, and patients have had to do because doctors aren't doing it uh, for us. Yeah. And it is, it's been kind of a mind bend for me because I have also known that, I mean, there are huge ties between emotional trauma and PTSD and what? chronic illness or cancer, and, and that it really can help to manage mental health at the same time as physical health. But it doesn't mean that if someone comes in with cancer symptoms and you don't find it through the first testing, it all comes back negative, that you just say, 
all right, we'll take an antidepressant and we're, and get cognitive behavioral therapy when you also need chemotherapy. <laughs> yeah. And I want to clarify, I'm very pro whatever type of mental health help that you can get. That's, that's really important. And I'm not in any way denigrating that it's just to have it minimized to just that as the, it, what it's usually the implication is, is that your depression is causing you to misperceive what's happening in your body. And that is false. <laughs> that is completely incorrect. I, I completely agree though, that the trauma, this is, I read about this a lot in the book, that like, I, I basically haven't met a single woman who doesn't have a history of trauma in their usually childhood, but just, you know, previous to becoming sick. And, but that again, to, to, to just say that, oh, then these symptoms are psychosomatic is, is just false. There's so, we know that most illnesses correspond to uh, um, people with higher rates of trauma in their childhood tend to develop chronic illnesses of all kinds as they grow up. That's a, that is a known phenomenon that trauma, it basically predisposes you to, to developing chronic illnesses. And so of course these aren't any different. <laughs> it's just that we don't understand these very well and the chief symptoms happen to be invisible. So they're very easy to dismiss. Like if the, prom if the primary symptoms are like fatigue and pain, those are not unimportant symptoms. They just happen to be unprovable. <laughs> yeah. And it's, but you would never discount a, another type of patient with like a known illness. You would never like tell them to just like get over <laughs> that they feel mortally exhausted or that they're in horrific pain. I mean, you, that would just, again, be <laughs> criminal. You can't do that. <laughs> but that is what happens with this type of patient. It's just like, well, but your lab, Ms. Ramey, your labs are perfectly normal and therefore you are perfectly normal. Yeah. 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 I, yes. I, I think there's such a need for, and I'm glad that, that you're seeing it happen because you've been at this terrible nightmare game for longer than I have. It's been six years for me since I was I diagnosed with thoughts and inhalers, Danlos and everything. And I was like, I actually don't know you so tell me about your diagnoses and how long you've been sick yeah I mean I, I want to trade stories right but yeah um but you it's been for you since 2003 that was like the trigger event mm -hmm. yeah and and I have your book sitting in a p.o box waiting for me to go get it but right. because of the pandemic I can't I can't time it right when there aren't people in the post office to don't worry at all. We'll, we'll go over it today. <laughs> but, but, I, but I have, I've listened to you interviewed in a couple of other podcasts and also listened to your music. And I just love your music. It's, it's really amazing. Our, our styles of songwriting are a, a bit similar, like in arrangements. I love working with strings too. Oh, I didn't know you were a musician. I know I am like very unfamiliar with <laughs> Yeah, I, I just got introduced to you through Philip and we set this up. And so this is all new to me. This is exciting. You're a musician. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love I love your album that's on Spotify and um just yeah, it's it's a <laughs> buckle up. There's some like we're kindred spirits. <laughs> yeah, this is exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to go look at everything after we get off of this call and listen to your music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um the reason why I know Philip and I'm wondering how you know him too. I was doing um I was in the music scene in DC when I started getting sick um when I was 25 years old in 2015, 2014. And um I, yeah, I, then I had to go back. It's funny. I, I was torn from my life and career in DC, um, and had to go back home to my parents in Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. and you were torn from a life and had to go back to DC where your parents were, but, um, sorry, I'm laughing, but it's like, I know. Ha -ha, yeah, ha -ha. <laughs> yeah, I'm very sorry that you have gone through everything you've gone through. It's likewise. Don't, don't yeah. worry about it's not okay and and that's why we're talking about it to like reach out to other people who are going through things and being told that they're yeah. rare and 
to help shift the conversation and mainstream medicine, I think is my goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it helps to laugh about it because otherwise it's just too, too bad. It's too horrible. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gotta yeah. laugh at life. But um, anyway, I was here when it began. Yeah, I was in DC when it kind of, when the like worst trigger event began, but mm -hmm. I uh, was traveling around the west coast it in the way that a, a womi would be able to do a tour like traveling around we're doing one show every three months and like having lots of cushion for rest but i was doing a series that i co-organized with some of my other friends who are chronically ill called the sick women and queers shows mm -hmm. and philip was in a in a band uh, called marrow that played at one in portland um, that was hosted by Luz Elena Mendoza of the band Ila Bamba. That's how I know Philip, my uh, my friend Kelly McFarland. Do you know Kelly? Um, oh. She was in one iteration of Ila Bamba because <laughs> you know there have been a couple of sort of incarnations of yeah. the band. She was in one <laughs> version of it, and they came to Tucson, and I was there, and they stayed at my house. And that's how I met Philip. <laughs> oh, the whole band stayed with you. Yes, I actually left my house so that they could take over and like, oh, stay there. That's <laughs> so nice. But they're so lovely, everybody. And I know Andrew Kelly's husband. I guess I guess you probably don't know this this era of Ila Bamba. It was like 2016, 17, that that time. Yeah, yeah. I that's when I started connecting with them as well. But I, I had been a fan of them since 2010, 2009, um, just before I knew that I had a chronic illness. Um, and before I knew that one of their most well known songs, Juniper, was about kind of having a chronic illness. Yeah, having, having <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> about, <laughs> Um, yeah, Luz was interviewed on a previous podcast <laughs> episode, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I, I just like listen. Whales are very, have been very important in my mm -hmm. healing story and just always loved listening to that song and was doing like playing a show for my friend's birthday who I knew through environmental activism and he connected me with Luz and anyway it's just it's fun how these connections happen yeah but um I was I did this series called the sick women and queers shows mm -hmm. and <clears throat> we would highlight um poets and and writers and dancers and musicians who were dealing with chronic illness and do like skits um and like show art and comics of, about um like statistics about the gender bias trend in the healthcare system and and disbelieving women especially about how you know it affects people of all genders mm -hmm. um and fat phobia and uh mm -hmm. you know racial disparities and just talking about th these trends that we're seeing but like processing it through music and, and art so that's how I knew Philip um mm -hmm. and yeah so so you were living in Tucson in 2016-17 yeah I moved to Tucson 2012 and then I actually had my like worst period of illness from 2013 to 15. Um, and, so, but I was in Tucson during that time, but I got, so I don't know if you've ever seen, but like the really severe version of MECFS is like, it, it's, it, it's unspeakably bad. You can't sit up, you can't feed yourself, you can't shower. It's just horrific. And so I had a period of that uh, in that period, and then I came out of it in 2000, the end of 2015, basically, and uh, yeah, and 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 started doing more, so or a little bit more music stuff. I really haven't actually been able to do very much like public music in uh, since like 2010, 11, that time. Um, but but you know, some I play the occasional show. But I still am like, a, <laughs> I know so many musicians. And so when they come through town, like wherever I'm staying, I usually try to meet up with whoever my 
music friends are from San Francisco because San Francisco is such like a, a great place to be a musician. <laughs> There's just so many wonderful, wonderful ones there. So anyway, but then when Ilabamba came through in 2016 or 17, one of those two, that's when I met him. <clears throat> and I know, and Luz had been introduced to me. Do you know Pete Lee? Um, oh, he directed your music video. He did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw yeah. that. So beautiful. Yes, he's he's a friend and he is friends with Luz. I actually met her through him first. He was like, I think you guys are the same. <laughs> and, uh, and introduced us and she told me a little bit about her story. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> we are. We're, I mean, not personality wise, but uh, story wise. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so hard to like summarize the, you know, the health stuff <laughs> that we've had um, and the timeline of everything. But I guess we we could try to summarize a timeline. I mean, this is the problem that I have when I go into doctor's offices is I cannot summarize it succinctly. Mm -hmm. um, but since you asked, I was diagnosed in 2015 um, with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia mm -hmm. and hold that, you know, you're completely rare that that's so rare. <laughs> and, so weird because I'm diagnosed with those things. So you must be the only two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you happen to know Jessica Slice? No. Oh, well, she, she was, she's doing her PhD on gender disparity with women with chronic illness and has postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and is at Columbia, but she lives, she lived in San Francisco area. So yeah, just, just <laughs> another, just another coincidence, yeah. not a coincidence, but um, I recorded an album. I got a grant to make an album called the Canary Collective volume one, and it features a bunch of other um, people with chronic illness like Jessica reads part of her writing about it and there mm -hmm. was like an amazing chronic illness advocate who passed away who had POTS um, named Jess Jacobs and everyone everyone that she saw in the medical field would call her like a unicorn because they're mm -hmm. like how can you possibly have a EDS and POTS it's like what like those go together like it's whole mm -hmm. that's like that's like the first thing you would, if you're familiar with these problems, that's like, they always go together, not always, but it's, it's very, very common. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, in one of your interviews, I, I did all this homework this morning. So I, I, I just like listened to you a bunch more of homework. No. I just <laughs> roll out of bed and be like, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but you, you said in one of your podcast something about oh well and it's gone it's gone out of my brain it'll come back to me yeah I'll try to keep it okay um yeah 2015 and so then I was told that that was really rare and then I instead um like a couple months into that diagnosis was told by a pain specialist um that I had chronic Lyme and mm -hmm. chronic viruses and Epstein-Barr, mm -hmm. um, which was a concept that I was like, what? No, I've been tested for Lyme disease, you know, right. already. Mm -hmm. And it's come back negative a million times. And she's like, yeah, unfortunately, there's a huge misunderstanding about it. It's really controversial, but now you're going to need to start um, like antibiotics for Lyme. And like, my trigger event was a bug bite um, as part of a work trip in Virginia, in West Virginia. So it could have been like a straw on a camel's back, but mm -hmm. I feel like the whole entire picture of my health Perfect. has just, you know, you cannot isolate it. Mm -hmm. um, that And oh, that's what I was going to say, as you said, when your pain was decreased by 75%, it's like if you have your arm is on fire, um, mm -hmm. and you put out 75% of the fire, like, 
yeah, that's great, but you're still going to be like, on fire. <laughs> yeah, like, ouch. It's better if your whole body is on fire and you can narrow it down to just like the tip of your pinky, it's not like you're like, I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. walk around with this flame and you can't. It's, it's, it's an interesting area of pain medicine because I'm like, the way that we quantify and talk about pain, it's just like, I, this all seems wrong to me because there are just so many different types and it, a scale of one to 10 obviously is inadequate. And yeah, it just, if you are, it's the same thing with just illness in general. That's like, yeah, is it better to not be bedridden and, and fed broth by your mom? Like, yeah, but if you still feel like you've got the flu half the time, like that's not some major <laughs> uh, achievement or it's not the achievement that I think other people want it to be, which is like some type of remission. It's like, no, it's just that I am glad, I am glad, <laughs> but I'm not. It, if somebody else woke up today, was healthy yesterday and woke up with what I'm describing now as like, quote, better, they would run to the emergency room, right? They would be... Yeah horrified and so it just doesn't make any sense to like measure progress that way kind of in the same way that like you wouldn't measure progress like if you're shrinking a tumor you don't like shrink it down to a quarter of the size and be like all right <laughs> done <laughs> you know it's like that's not it's still going to be problematic it can get much worse again like it's not you do I don't know there's just so many metrics that don't make any sense that are all sort of structured around the same thing as trying to tell you that it's in your head or you're just depressed, which is just a way to dismiss it. <laughs> and so like the same thing with like telling you that, well, if you reduced your pain by X amount or if you reduced your symptoms by X amount, it's I'm I, the outside person, I'm telling you that you should be great and, and glad. It's like, it's just a way for them to be like, it's done, <laughs> it's over, it's not happening. And it's it's just because they don't know what else to do and that's again I get it but you can't do that <laughs> you just it's, it's just not it is it's wrong it is morally wrong to do that you would not do that with any other illness but it's just there's so many tactics to try to um, shrink and minimize and dismiss these problems mainly springing from that they just don't know what's going on and they don't know what it is. And I understand how disorienting that might be, but that's just too bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I use the metaphor and a lot of people use the or analogy of like, if, if you're smelling or your smoke alarm is going off all the time. Um, it's like if a wife is sleeping in bed with her husband and she hears the smoke alarm um and then you know they're they don't hear it and or mm -hmm. they 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 see that she can hear it <laughs> but they're mm -hmm. telling you okay put pillows you know on your ears or like wear earplugs mm -hmm. and but okay. there there really is a fire like either there really is a fire or this this smoke alarm is <laughs> really doing a number but just the the harm done by telling someone that they're imagining the smoke alarm that there's no possible way that they could be missing the fire because they haven't even looked in all the rooms yeah. so like the, it just it's I really the same analogy i'm like if you're a doctor you're basically the fireman of you know the, in terms of our, our physical bodies, the doctors are the firemen of our physical bodies. We have a fire, they come and they help us put it out. <laughs> if I were to call the fire department and be like, well, my house is burning to the ground, you gotta come, this is just what you were just saying. You gotta come immediately and they just say, sight unseen, just talking to me on the phone, say, nah, I don't buy it, click. No, <laughs> you cannot do that, you cannot not, Look, and this is what's sort of, I think that this is where things get that's so much more complicated because they do look, they run tests, but they're running the wrong test. They're not, they haven't developed, they haven't done the research and development to actually figure out what is going on. That is an unequivocal truth. Like when you look at the amount of funding that's been allocated to study any of these analysis, it's like 
it's like a percentage of one penny for every hundred dollars is allocated for cancer, right? And so it's it's not you just can't nobody in good faith could say like, well, we really looked into it and actually there's nothing going on. It's like, no, 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 no. You haven't looked into it. They're mysterious, not because they're impossible to understand, but because they haven't been properly researched. And even the research that hasn't been done hasn't been properly incorporated into the medical establishment. But the problem is, is that medicine doesn't think of itself as having these big gaps in its in in the operations in the standard operating procedure it doesn't it i saw a doctor and he was like oh there's no, no such thing as a mystery illness anymore we've solved everything and i was like what i was like well what's wrong with me and he was like oh i think you need to see a psychiatrist <laughs> and i was like oh i see so when you don't when you're not studying the problem then you don't develop the tests if you don't develop the tests you cannot run the appropriate testing on the patient sitting in front of you to say yes or no, you've got X, Y, and Z disease. And so they run the wrong tests. It's like if you come in with cancer, but they run tests like eye exams and you know tests for Lou Gehrig's disease and something completely different. It's like, of course those are gonna be negative because that's not what's wrong with you. You have to test for the correct thing. And if you haven't invested in developing the, the, the correct testing that would help isolate what exactly has gone wrong in these patients, of course you can't test, but, but there's that, that gap is just being completely waved away as if it's not there. And so they're just like, well, we did run the tests. And so therefore you are not, you are not sick. And that is why I feel justified in telling you that it must be some sort of psychosomatic disorder. Yeah. And that's just, completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was working in DC. I, I had just gotten my dream job and I was told that things were psychosomatic at first. Um, I, I had just gotten a job with friends committee on national legislation, which is like a, a public interest lobbying firm right across from the Senate heart building on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill. And my mm -hmm. job was traveling around the country, giving workshops to young people on how they can lobby their member of Congress about climate change and to convince members of Congress across the aisle on all sides that uh, what was happening in their home districts, you know, telling stories of, you know, the oyster industry in Louisiana struggling or like wildfires in California, that those were all symptoms of the bigger picture of climate crises, trends that were happening, and to use the power of storytelling in order to lobby and convince. Mm -hmm. Very ironically that I was not able to use the power of storytelling to lobby and convince my own doctors that I needed help in the climate crises within my own ecosystems of my body. But I that was teaching others how to do that. And so I was like, just loving my job and um, traveling like to Atlanta, Georgia in the winter of 2014, I guess. And I had that fall, I had just moved there and all of my coworkers and I went on a camping trip in West Virginia and we were like kayaking along the Potomac. And um, I just like got this bug bite in the back of my neck. And that night I, my lymph node, like the place where I'd gotten bitten swelled to like the size of a ping pong ball in the back of my neck. And then my lymph nodes were like rock hard. And I woke up having drenched my sheets in sweat. And I started like when I was typing at my computer, I would be like having tears stream down my face because my neck and my wrists and hands, it, they were hurting so badly from typing and sitting. And then I just stopped getting my period, which mm -hmm. I had never like missed a period. I had always had ha terribly heavy mm -hmm. ones. Um, and then I started getting really sensitive to light. And as I was like driving my rental car around in uh, Virginia or Georgia, I was like having to squint and use like my left foot on the accelerator because my right ankle was so painful and just different workarounds that I kept on like working and going mm -hmm. myself. Um, but I, since I was so busy, like 
you know, when you have these symptoms come up, you're like, okay, I, I really should make an appointment with a doctor, but I had just moved there and I, my insurance wasn't even set up with my job yet. So I finally like got an appointment with a primary care physician. And the first one that I saw after the bug bite, I wrote all my symptoms down because at that point I, I was having tachycardia, heart issues, like all kinds of stuff. And in the new patient paperwork, she just took a look at it. She said, I, I have like seven minutes and she was so rushed. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but there's no possible way that you can have all these symptoms. And there's no possible way I can discuss all of them with you. So you have to choose one, just yep. choose one that you want to focus on today. Yep. And I, that's like really hard. How do you ask mother earth to choose all like one symptom? Do you choose to talk about the wildfires that are going on? Do you choose to talk about the blizzards? Do you choose to talk about the rising tides? Like, okay, we can choose one, but they're all connected. And so I chose the fact that I all of a sudden hadn't gotten my period and I was peeing like nine times a night with absolute, like terrible pelvic pain. And I, I know that you have had a, you know, a thing or two about pelvic pain. Um, and so I, I chose that symptom and she tested me for UTIs and all kinds of things and um, came back with nothing. But then she said, oh, maybe this is something really rare that most doctors don't test for, but it's called urea plasma. And it's this certain kind of infection that most people don't test for. Um, and some, some doctors believe that it can cause infertility and is contagious. And some doctors believe it's just, it's an existing kind of microbe that in the microbiome like exists and it's not a problem if it's a little out of balance. So she tested that and I tested positive with whatever test she used. And then she prescribed me doxycycline mm -hmm. um, for 10 days. And when I came back and my symptoms had only gotten worse, mostly um, she said, well, I said, do you think there's any possible way that like any of this, since it all started after the bug bite that that like, I mean, not everything started, but that it might be related to the bug bite. And she's like, well, if it's Lyme disease, then like the doxy would have taken care of it. So like whatever infection you had, like it's gone. So, um, so then I just discouraged, went to hundreds, li li yeah. you know, literally hundreds of doctors that year, like specialists, and neurologists and gastroenterologists and pain people. And by the time um, I had been working in DC for about seven months, I think, um, I got to a point where my POTS was so bad and light sensitivity, I had to wear like a mask on my eyes, earplugs, um, had to be helped to the bathroom. Um, and for a couple of years, like I couldn't sit upright in a chair. I had severe ME um, mm -hmm. and could, yeah, couldn't really like lift my head from the pillow except for a couple minutes a day. Yeah. So it got, <laughs> it got, it escalated quickly, but when I all of a sudden obviously couldn't work cause I couldn't even hardly talk, um, that I applied for disability and the disability people, like they sent back the rejection of me getting disability insurance saying that A, there's no possible way that and any illness that exists in the world has system like your cardiac system and your gut system and your musculoskeletal and your reproductive organs affected. Mm -hmm. So this is somatoform disorder. And the only thing that my insurance would like cover is cognitive behavioral therapy. Wait, you froze. You froze. Oh, oh and they said insurance would cover as what? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Of course. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So that was what they recommended that I do and to return to work. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't get too conditioned because that would actually be the whole problem in the first place. Yeah. You need to work out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then I, I was eventually diagnosed with interstitial cystitis and endometriosis as well. Um, but they, they tried many, many times. They said the only answer is to balloon your bladder and to do the to do stretching, you know, where 
kind of a similar, uh, but not as horrifying procedure that they recommended for you and, and did. And um, so it's a, it's been a lot, I've tried a lot of different things um, over the years and I've obviously gotten way better part of, you know, environmental illness and MCS chemical sensitivity is also that developed to a severe degree. So I have been um, isolating in this non-toxic trailer bunker in the desert um, off and on for the last two years. I like lived in the back of my minivan for a couple months um, and just tried a lot of different environments because no housing, like my body, my tongue would swell and I wouldn't be able to like breathe very well in like any housing situation that I tried. So it's been a long journey. Um, (laughs) I'm so, first of all, I'm so sorry. And I just, that story right? If you've never been sick and you don't, or if you're part of a traditional medical establishment, like that story sounds like, well, that that's impossible. That is like verbatim the story of so many people. And why would anyone, how could anyone make up that story (laughs) over and over and over again? If there's like a secret society that's like, You know, like whispering in back rooms. It's like, okay, here's what we're gonna tell them. And we're gonna make <laughs> disease for which we can't get disability payment, for which nobody is going to believe us. That we can't get any of like the good drugs. Like, let's make up that disease. Like just <laughs> miserable fucking disease that drives us into total isolation, where we're cut off from all the people that we love from doing the work that we love. Like. Let's do it. <laughs> like, yeah, that sounds crazy. like a blast. <laughs> it's crazy. It doesn't, it's completely resists logic. Like what, because I do think that a lot of people who are unfamiliar with this, like that is kind of what they think in their mind. I'm like, oh, it sounds like somebody, like maybe they're a hypochondriac or something. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that is, I, I want you to go like sit down with a real hypochondriac. It's like a new thing every single time, a new illness, it's a new, it's not like an ongoing pattern of an illness. It's like, that it, they're just completely different. It's not the same thing. And it's, it just makes me crazy that you and so many other people would feel, would be made to feel so great, like, that this is your fault, that there's something that like you're doing that's either causing it or causing you to misperceive it instead of like the appropriate response, which is like a five alarm fire where we come in and they're like, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to get you in an isolated environment first to reduce all of those triggers. We're gonna you know, start at least the known treatments that we can start right now, do the testing that's known that we can do for patients like this. Like, that is what should be happening, not being sent to this incredibly wasteful uh, merry-go-round around and around and around and around to see a million doctors who are all just gonna basically start compounding this kind of psychological abuse by telling you that you've made it up. Like that's very, for me, that's been a very uh, damaging (laughs) phenomenon. And it just makes me crazy that the story that you're telling is not in any way unusual. <laughs> like, yeah. Sad. It is the norm. It, uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I like still get so exercised over this because I'm just like, I, I don't understand. I mean, I'm trying to do this. A lot of people are trying to do this, but I don't understand how it's not breaking through even still in medicine. It's starting to a little bit, but I I just, I don't, if your whole job is like pattern recognition, which it is as a doctor, how can you not? I I almost wish that like we were just jump ahead to the robot revolution in medicine, because I think that it would, there would, there wouldn't be any of this ego or bias, you know, baked into it. It would just be like, beep, boop, bop. Yep. You're a woman. <laughs> you have a yeah. immunological, immunological disease type, you know, 
H. <laughs> and that's we this is this is a very typical presentation of this, you know, uh, section of the uh, MIE disease. <laughs> um, I, it's just I, I I can't understand it. I just <laughs> and the doctors I know that have come around, usually they were regular doctors. They got really sick themselves. They went down the rabbit hole and and had to figure it out for themselves. And those are the ones that get it. And they all come out in the same place as, as you and I, which is like basically the same types of diagnoses, the same loose framework for trying to understand how they fit together, like what's, hap what's happening, what's going on, like, and what treatments are at least helpful or palliative, if not curative. And those doctors, there's nothing different about them than the other doctors. They're trained in the exact same way. It's just that they've had the personal experience of it and they, but it shouldn't take that <laughs> to be able to believe the person sitting in front of you. Yeah. That's it's their job to recognize patterns as as you've said. And thank you for the reaction as you Sorry, like, <laughs> Yeah, that's the appropriate reaction that we deserve. So I say the same to you listening to your story, like holy crap, like that's just not okay. And I'm so sorry that you've been through that too. And I'm so excited for the future generations that are going to benefit from people like us connecting the dots and changing the conversation so that so that they are able to get help and have the the community support and not the stigma and the doubting and the isolation. Yes, and those are I really think those are three things that like can begin now which is like the to be plugged into a community right away this matters so much to get at least the palliative care that exists to help people at least buffer some of the worst of it, at least to try some of the things that exist, you know, like if you've got POTS, at least to, know, to be diagnosed early with that and to be started on maybe surgical cortisone or something, you know, to at least attempt to or assault or whatever it is to attempt to address the things instead of doing a million, because I'm sure you've also done like a million crazy <laughs> crazy things to try to get better and it's like that also I write about this a lot in the book but like that is also I understand why I did all of those things I'm not ashamed of it but it's like what a waste of time and money and emotional energy and I just to be able to give people a community the treatments that are known to at least work for some sizable proportion of people um, and then to and then to shut down completely the the medical trauma, the gaslighting, um, like just those three things, that would go a long way to minimizing like the active harm being done to this patient population, which in my opinion is is big. <laughs> like I, that the the illnesses themselves are so bad. But the harm done by having no support, active sort of malice coming from the, your caretakers um, and not having a way to communicate with your friends and family, having that be so difficult and, and straining so many relationships like in your close, the, the people that are, that are meant to be like your inner circle, that often falls apart for a lot of people because they don't believe you because your doctors don't believe you. And that's like, it's just terrible. It's like to take away all of that from a patient is to me is just like an incalculable harm. And so I really hope that 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 does start to change soon. Yeah. And do you feel like you can try and summarize the timeline, the general timeline for you as well with your health diagnoses? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my that's been going on so long is like, is like it is a little complex and convoluted. But basically, when I was senior in college, um, I had a urinary tract infection. I was not sick otherwise. Um, uh, 
I was like in the middle of, I was taking an extra class. I was directing the school musical. I was like the head of an acapella group as a singer in a band. Like I was like super <laughs> active and happy. And I, but I was having these UTIs that wouldn't go away even with antibiotic treatment. And I'd never had UTIs before. And so um, after six months of that, I was sent to, my parents actually sent me to a friend of theirs here in DC when I was home for break as like this like hotshot urologist to go see. And the hotshot urologist said, he, he did a, a urine culture, it was negative. So he said, well, what I think is going on here is you have um, urethral spasms. And so what we're gonna do is called the urethral dilation. And this is like a procedure where they, this is graphic to the listener if you wanna like skip ahead. That's <laughs> fine. Um, you, uh, it's like you put a device in the urethra and you kind of rip it a little bit, you stretch it, you, you rip it a little bit. That's what he said to me. You rip the urethra a little bit and then that breaks up the spasm. It's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's certainly not painful. You'll be, you'll be fine. You'll be in and out of the office today. We'll just do it today is what he said. So I was like, okay, that's fine. And again, this is like, I had up until that point, no reasons whatsoever to doubt medicine in any way whatsoever. <laughs> like I was, my parents are doctors. I just saddled up. And so I got, uh, we did this procedure and uh, instead of being not painful, it was, you know, just like being hit by a lightning bolt in my vagina. It was incredible incredibly painful and I'm screaming and crying and he's yelling at me you know what are you know I don't want to do all things but we're but we're all screaming it's like this horrible 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 event and um but but then when it was over I was like okay well that was horrible but it's over and hopefully this will get better there's like sirens in the background I feel like it's like Thank you, Siren. <laughs> That's how I felt. <laughs> and so I go home and I am thinking that I'll be fine. But within, uh, as the night goes on, I start to feel kind of like I might be getting sick or I might be getting flu or something. And in the middle of the night, I wake up and I've got, you know, this sky high fever. I'm shaking uncontrollably. I'm sweating and keep describing. Um, and I had become septic and which is an infection of the bloodstream. So I had to be taken to the hospital, um, put on IV antibiotics. And, but again, once I was sort of stabilized, it was like, okay, but now <laughs> everything is gonna be fine and go back to normal, I'm gonna bounce back because that's what we do as young, young, young women, <laughs> we bounce back. And so I was sent back to college with a pick line of antibiotics, it's like a, uh, an IV that's like you carry around with you. And um, I was continued to be in incredible, not continued to be, starting from the procedure with the urologist and an incredible amount of uh, vaginal pain. And that was sort of distinct from the UTI pain that I had had before. I still have that, but this was like much worse, but I kind of just thought, oh, my original thing is getting getting worse, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, but I also was just felt sick constantly. I felt, I felt incredibly tired all the time. All my muscles ached and burned all the time. My colon stopped functioning. I started to develop all these food sensitivities, chemical sensitivities. Uh, I didn't have light sensitivities, um, but basically was just sick all of a sudden, but for no reason, nobody could, I, you know, after this, this went on, um, for a couple more weeks, and then I went, had to go back home and was went to a million more doctors to try to figure out what was going on because, like I said, I had been like super duper active and all of a sudden couldn't do any of it. Couldn't I had to stop directing the musical? The musical director had to take over, like the person that does the piano. Like nobody drops out of <laughs> doing that at like the last minute. It was like this incredibly fun thing that I was doing and, and had to stop and basically. That first year, I saw, I mean, probably 20 or 25 doctors and all top shelf doctors because my parents are so well connected because they themselves are doctors. And 
they tested me for everything in the world um because it was taken very seriously in the beginning because it was really obvious that like i had been okay and then completely not okay um but as all the tests came back negative 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 um that is when like a new diagnosis started to rise to the top where like the first doctor said this i'm sure you, it sounds like you read this scene in the book but like i had this really painful test done it's very traumatizing that was negative and afterwards he calls my parents into the into the uh into the room with with us to go over his findings. And he was like, well, the test was negative. She doesn't have a urethral diverticulum that he was looking for. And then he, I remember so distinctly, he's like, he says to my parents, he's like, I think what you need to consider, and he looks over his glasses, is that like so many young women her age are probably psychological. <laughs> I'm sitting right there. And I was just so, especially having just gone through such an invasive, painful procedure I just could I was so just destroyed this <laughs> because I was like really doing my best to try to figure out what was wrong and was letting myself go through all of these extremely painful tests and procedures and all this stuff and then once he said that then that really started to become like the prevailing thought it's like um, a scarlet a on yes <laughs> of like anxiety and it's yeah. alphabetically first when it shows up in your medical records. So then mm -hmm. from that point on. That's right, that's right. This is like so many other young women, she's just ultra anxious about life. And now about that, that anxiety has turned to her health, right? And that's what's going on here. And she believes, quote unquote, that she's got all these different symptoms when in fact, she doesn't. And never mind the fact that Prior to this, I did not have any psychological, I was, not, you know, a lot of kids in college have anxiety, depression, and all of these issues. And that's difficult and, and important to treat and take care of. But I did not have those problems. That is not what was going on with me. And so for it to suddenly emerge, again, this is like just what chafes me so hard is like it resists logic and reason that like that would become the the diagnosis it's like but that wait <laughs> but that's not that doesn't fit with this case history that doesn't fit with the rest of this patient profile or what she's saying or the way that she's presenting like it doesn't it it just uh, it, it's presented as this like coolly logical like i think what we putting our emotions aside here's what we have to conclude <laughs> and it's like well, no i think that your emotions might have something to do <laughs> with this Okay, so I think that you may have a prejudice against people like me that you haven't acknowledged. <laughs> and anyway, so my case then, to, to make it like a very long story short, I, for a couple of years, I tried to find a diagnosis in regular medicine and couldn't. Um, I had a very brief period of like a year and a half where I actually got a lot better. I'd been put on... Um, a flu can for something else my mom put because I had yeast infections and but somebody else had talked to me about candida because I had so many gut problems and she was like you should consider that maybe you've got candida and my mom oh sorry that was actually after the day can at the time I was put on the day flu can I got so much better and I didn't understand why I was like I just had been like risen from the dead and but at the time my mom was like just don't <laughs> just go with it. You know, it doesn't matter why you're getting better, just just go with it. And so I did. And I had this period where I was doing, I was probably like 80% better. And and then kind of over the years, things went kind of downhill, sometimes uphill. At some point I defected from regular medicine and went into just alternative medicine with special diets and acupuncture and yoga and all these things, a lot of which helped me. They at least like stopped me from this like downward trajectory that I was on and sort of at least flattened things out from getting worse and, and kind of got me a little bit better. Um, I picked up a bunch of diagnoses along the way, POTS, um, although the, my POTS, I, I got a diagnosis of POTS pretty early on, but that didn't become an issue, a big issue for me until the last like six or seven years. Um, uh, 
was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, I definitely do have an ACFS. Um, I went to the Mayo Clinic and was finally diagnosed with something called CRPS, which is complex regional pain syndrome. And that's like a, it's, a, it's the most severe pain syndrome you can have. It's extremely, it's, it's very bad. Again, the sirens <laughs> really <laughs> here to underscore the point. Um, sorry, I just, Right outside. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like I always describe it to people. It literally feels like you peeled back a layer of skin and just put lemon juice on that layer of skin. It's like so bad. Then it spreads. And so it had started in the vagina, but it spread to like the bladder and the spine and my left leg and my whole abdomen. It is a horrible, <laughs> horrible disease. It but very commonly comorbid with these illnesses that we're talking about. Um, it's, it's, it's on the less common side in this family of problems, but it's not, uh, it, you're not a unicorn if you <laughs> have after NACFS and CRPS. Um, and, and then I've also been diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm like in the, I don't have the kind that you can genetically diagnose. Um, and I'm not actually that hypermobile, but they, some doctors think that I have it. So, and yeah, and and so that's kind of, and then the only other thing is just that, and this is a very big thing, is that in 2017, I finally pressured a doctor. I went to so many pelvic pain doctors to have them look in the vagina to look for if anything had gone wrong in that original procedure with that guy. Because in the beginning, I didn't think that. I was like, well, I mean, it was really painful, but like he would have said something if something went wrong, right? Like he's a friend of my family, like they're, he's a colleague of my parents, like something, somebody would have said, he would have said something. And in, in the beginning, they actually did a, a transvaginal sonogram that showed a little mass right where I was describing the locus of all the pain. And I had taken that sonogram to a bunch of doctors along the way and said like, listen, I know nobody knows what's wrong with me, but like, could we just repeat this one test because like this is a physical picture <laughs> of a thing sitting right where I have like the the center point of all of my pain and everybody told me no <laughs> everybody said because what you need is um in my case because it's so painful to do a transvaginal sonogram it's the one where they put the the wand inside of you and I can't do that I can't have sex I can't I mean I, I cannot do that and so I was like, well, could we just do that under anesthesia? I mean, people get anesthesia for dental work. Why can't I do this for this incredibly traumatic procedure that I would have to do in order to, to get the picture of this? And they were like, no, that's ridiculous. That would be so indulgent. We're not going to book an OR just so you can get anesthesia. Anesthesia carries risks, Ms. Ramey. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, which, like, having had, like, a million surgeries since then, like, it's just nobody brought up anesthesia having risks when I needed to have surgery. So anyway, they wouldn't do it until finally this one doctor, um, I pressured him enough to think about the case again. And he said, you know, when you have pain in that way that never moves, that's always in one spot, it's usually neuropathic and it could be something called a neuroma. And I, nobody had ever said that word to me before. And so I looked that up. And a neuroma is this fibrous tissue, it's a tumor, but it's this fibrous tissue that grows on a nerve when it's been damaged. Um, and one of the things that can damage it is a surgical instrument that's like nicked one of the nerves. And that's why I'm reading this and I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and, so, and then if it can be extremely painful, it feels like you've like hammered a nail into the nerve, which is the verbatim terminology I had used with all of my gynecologists is it feels like somebody like hammered a thumbtack into my vagina Ugh. and yeah and, and and then if left untreated it's very common for a neuroma or a similar type of scar tissue clamping the nerve uh to become something called complex regional pain syndrome and I was like what <laughs> I was like how do I get tested for this right away? I asked the doctor and he's like, you need a transvaginal sonogram. And I was like, oh, wait, I know that. It was hot. I, 
he was like, but you need it under anesthesia. Just go to this guy and he'll do it under anesthesia for you. So I did. And he did the procedure and I had a huge mass sitting right at the intersection of all of these nerves, right where I'd been, right where the original mass had been discovered in 2003. And right where I'd been saying, I have all this pain. And it started with that procedure with that one neurologist. And yeah, <laughs> so, so anyways, and I had a vindication. Of, what's that? Vindication. Yeah, serious vindication and just, and also I don't think I've ever felt so much like relief and vindication and rage at the same time. Like I was so fucking angry. I just, cause I really, really had tried to get them to look for exactly something like that and they just wouldn't do it. And the Mayo Clinic wouldn't do it. Like nobody would do it. And man, <laughs> That was so anyway that was and so i've had it's it's more complicated than that it's it's such a de delicate area you can't just like go in and cut out all all the nerves in your vagina it's just such a nerve rich area so i've had some surgery to try to fix that and it, it has made things a little bit better but that's i guess that interview that i gave where i said if you're on fire 100 percent and you reduce it i wouldn't say i've reduced it 75 percent, but no matter how much you reduce it it doesn't matter until it's 100% gone if it's on fire. It just doesn't. It's, I guess that matters. Like, that matters if, like, the degree of the pain has been lessened from 10 to 1. Like, but if the area of the pain has been shrunk down mm -hmm. from, you know, uh, you know, covering an area of 10 centimeters to one centimeter, it, that just doesn't matter if the one still feels like there's a, a nail hammered into it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I am so mad with you. That just like that happens to so many people. Mm -hmm. And in turn, just like, yeah, it's the most damaging in some ways to be routinely told that you are your instincts about something and you know you're an academic intelligent person it seems you are I mean you're trying to figure this out and that you asked for that additional like step for actually looking at what's going on like you know you've never actually checked this bedroom that like my smoke alarm's been going off mm -hmm. for yeah actually opened the door and gone inside like and smoke is coming out the possible thing that we could possibly do and yeah. would do it it's like it, it really reminds it i write a lot about alice in wonderland but like there is so much that story so perfectly encapsulates what it's like it's like you're down the rabbit hole and like everyone you meet tells you you're crazy but they're like Tweedledum or Tweedledee, like spinning their like uh, beanie propeller like on their head, and you're like, wait, I know that I, I know that I'm not the crazy one here, but they are kind of the ones that understand this world and have all the power, and you're you're just kind of lost, and so it just doesn't matter that you know that you're not making it up. It's like you're just very powerless in that situation, or, or it feels that way. And yeah. yeah. And I mean, speaking of Alice in Wonderland, I, I, the reason why I have, you know, my band name and my kind of community name and the podcast name is the Canary Collective is I, all, I too, like you wanted a name for mm -hmm. this community of people that I was coming into contact with that it's just too difficult to ignore the similarities and parallels. So I call us canaries. You, you have the name Womi. Um, mm -hmm. And at first with the, you know, events that I was creating, I had, you know, sick women, <laughs> sick mm -hmm. women and queers, but it's like, you know, all genders, of course, but definitely there's, there's so much bias against people of certain genders, sexualities, and, and races that occurs. And, and you're more, you're more likely statistically, it has been proven that you are more likely to be told that it's all in your head. Um, if you're a certain identity in the doctor's office. Um, but I call us canaries because 
um, I have an inkling. I am not sure. I don't know. Um, science haven't hasn't like completely proven anything, but I do have an inkling that a huge piece of why so many people have chronic illness and mysterious illness has to do with what's going on with our ecosystems on earth, our food system, our yeah. soil, you know, our gut microbiomes being disrupted, our immune systems being affected by that, um, and having all kinds of ecosystem imbalances uh, from candida, like rising, it's not necessarily that that's the whole problem. And thus the solution is playing whack-a-mole and saying, okay, take diflucan for the rest of your life. It's, you know, pair, if a rise in parasites happen or a rise in certain bacteria or H. pylori or whatever is going on or Lyme, you know, a lot of people have the spirochete, all kinds of spirochete shaped bacteria mm -hmm. within them. Does it mean that they have Lyme symptoms or mm -hmm. Lyme syndrome or chronic Lyme. No, it doesn't always mean that. Um, and if you have urea, urea plasma right. show up when you look inside or you test your blood or test your urine and you do see those little guys swimming around, um, does that mean that you have or you are someone with that label and that is the problem not necessarily but i th i think all the toxins that we are drinking and breathing and are in our everyday products that my body stopped allowing me to breathe or like can't use old spice deodorant anymore which i yeah. used to love <laughs> the smell of um but all of that i think it's just there's so many factors but with alice in wonderland the mad hatters you know mm -hmm. And historically, we have so many times in human history when we've had things that we do where corporations are like, hey, I'm going to take that shortcut and I'm just going to do it this fast way. It's like it's a little more chemicals, but we'll pay people two cents an hour to like make this in a factory in Bangladesh and then like sell it at H&M and Walmart and then people are going to be wearing it on their legs and, you know, just all kinds of things that corporations take shortcuts and then like people start feeling weird in their bodies and they're like, yeah. people are like, oh, I wonder why. <laughs> yes, and Mad Hatters, they've discovered like there are a lot of um, neurological issues that were going on because of the toxins that people were putting in top hats that people were wearing. And I, I think that that will happen in the next 20 years. We will have a Mad Hatter moment for yeah. one year. I, I think there's no... There's no doubt. I don't have an inkling about that. You are correct. <laughs> There's no doubt because all the things that you just, when we look at this family of illnesses, like I said, there it's a neuroimmune endocrine set of disorders with gastrointestinal underpinning. All the things that you just brought up, these are known endocrine disruptors, uh, immune dysregulators. Like we, there's so much data or, or things that disrupt your gut microbiome. These are all these things that we've introduced into our lives, into our everyday environment that we've normalized that are not normal. None of Old Spice deodorant is not like some, you know, ancient thing that we've been doing <laughs> for hundreds of years. There's so much that we've changed in the last hundred years mm -hmm. from our diets to our chemical environment to the amount of sleep that we're getting to the amount of movement that we get. There is so much rapid change and we're not wired for that like we are we are wired for slow adaptation and being able to say to, to slowly look at okay this isn't working we have to turn back in this direction and this isn't working we need to turn this direction yeah and we don't have the opportunity to do that and and on top of, because the, the rate of change is so fast but also as you say the um profit incentive for all the people that are changing those things, the food industry, the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, I, it, the, the profit incentives for them are enormous. They're not small. <laughs> They're enormous. They're, their entire business model is essentially shutting down canary feedback. <laughs> and so because that is really threatening to what they're doing. And I understand that when you start to talk about this kind of thing, it does make you start to sound like a 
you know, QAnon <laughs> adjacent person, right? But that, but there are, there's, there's conspiracy theories. And then there's like things that have not just some evidence, but a true overabundance of evidence to say that X, Y, and Z things that we've changed, even if we just look at the gut microbiome, <laughs> the evidence that we've had that we have massively overhauled our gut microbiomes for it, to, for, to a negative effect, and that a altered gut microbiome has, a, has such a high correlation with the development of specifically these types of neurologic, immunologic, uh, and endocrine disorders, we can just look at that and it's like, yeah, is that not a, a, a perfect understanding of what's going on? No, but it's, it's certainly, that's so much more in terms of knowing what we should be looking at, what the research should be looking at than saying, oh, these are just a bunch of anxious, <laughs> anxious women. You know, it's like, there's so much data to say like, wait, wait, wait. actually we know <laughs> a lot of what could be causing these problems. It's just that the solutions are usually not like a pharmaceutical, right? They, and the solutions usually have to do with these big uncomfortable things having to to look at the changes you might have to make in your own life, but also like cultural, socio-cultural changes. And those, nobody wants to hear that. It's just like climate change. I mean, you're, you're more familiar with this than anyone. It's the same short-term thinking that if you, uh, if you enable short-term thinking and disable long-term thinking, you inevitably get this huge, massive hulking problem that is not just one thing that you can just like press a button and it's gonna go back to normal. It's like, now it's this enormous multifactorial monster that you actually have to intervene with so many different human behaviors, but also the way that so many different corporations are functioning. And, and it's just like this big complex problem because it's a big complex, set of behaviors, repeating behaviors that have gotten us into this place where we are now. And so it's, it's exact, I talk about this a lot in the book, like the parallels between climate change and these illnesses are like pretty overt. <laughs> like it's, and, and the resistance to wanting to, to take it seriously because of what it implies in terms of what we would all have to do to address it is the same. It's like, I don't want to think about that. This is unlike so many other illnesses, like somebody being diagnosed with it has, it's not going to affect me. They have to take their medication, but it doesn't affect the way that I think about the deodorant I use or the food that I'm eating or whatever. Yeah. Whereas these illnesses, they really, they, uh, they are like mirrors held up to everybody else and everybody else is like, no, thank you. <laughs> I do not want that. <laughs> and I can understand that. I, I feel pretty certain that like if I had not gotten sick, I would have been, I had a nightmare about this last night, <laughs> that I was the type of person at this age that was that is like the poo-pooing non-believer type of person. Now I like had this whole nightmare about this last night that I was acting that way because I had never, it, it, it was like a sliding doors thing. I had never become sick. And then I became the poo-pooing, you know, like, oh, you guys all believe you're quote sick and blah, blah, blah. Oh. And I, woke, I woke up and I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I've thought about that before because I can see that there were like, aspects of that in my personality prior to having dealt with it myself where I don't know there's like a, a type of person like a journalist or an academic or certain types of people you know that they they, they don't want to seem kooky right they want to yeah. seem serious and database and blah, blah 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 and the moment the data changes they're just like oh well the data shows without taking any responsibility for the fact that they were on the complete wrong side of it up until that moment. <laughs> but I can see parts of my personality where I'm like, that was, I think I could have been that journalist that would have been <laughs> wrong on this, which I feel like is important to be able to recognize that like, I, 
I understand the mindset of people who are doing the wrong thing here. I do get it, but that is not an excuse. (laughs) That does not mean that they get to continue acting this way. And just like with climate change, if you let that go on for too long, like you really start to enable these, this short-termism that is like ultimately very damaging for everyone, for that journalist and their family and their kids. Like it's not, there ha- we have to evolve a type of long-term thinking that is, has a partnership with short-term thinking, which is also important sometimes as well. It's just, we don't, we've really deactivated that part of our culture. Like it's, it's like off. You can see it trying to turn on (laughs) and it's like causing a lot of problems as it tries to turn on like an enormous amount of consternation (laughs) because of exactly what I was just saying is that because if you turn it on, then everyone has to like examine themselves and their lives and what they've been doing and inconvenient changes in lifestyle. Exactly. It's a whole series of inconvenient truths and but too fucking bad. They're much less inconvenient if you deal with them in the beginning. <laughs> no, because we are ahead in the mind and we are feeling the effects. Yes. We, if we have the convenience of ignoring these symptoms and carrying on, we 100% would have. I 100% would have. Exactly. That's so my good. body completely gave me no choice. No I took every possible choice to carry on the way I was going because that's human nature. Of course, we're going to do that. It's mm-hmm. just a cost benefit analysis. I totally agree with you. It's so succinct. I mean, it's so beautiful the way that you just put it about long term versus short term thinking. Yeah, it's and it's also I I think it this does have to do with like kind of more masculine ways of thinking, more feminine ways of thinking. I do think, and this is not necessarily correlated to being a man or, or a woman, like, but just more stereotypically feminine ways of thinking, even if you're a man that has a more feminine type of way of thinking about the world. I do think that the feminine way of thinking does tend to be longer term and does tend to be thinking, and you see this in like all the countries that are taking major action on climate change, they're all led by women. And that's yeah, just- pandemic. <laughs> And the pandemic, exactly. And it's like acute problems do tend to, I feel like that type of masculine response is like better tailored for like acute right now, deal with this issue right in front of us right now. And that's fine. That's great. That that's really important. But I think it does have to do with, again, with like the gendered aspects of all of this is that like, there's just so much about it that's just like, oh, I hate women and I hate feminine things and I hate this way of thinking that I think is very unconscious to a lot of people. But that doesn't, when something is unconscious does not mean that it's not there. And, and, And even just to like build that out a little bit, I feel like you see feminine, ways of thinking it's not just in women and it's not just in like more feminine brains it's like in communities you see it a lot in more marginalized communities and like in you know businesses run by black women tend to be like the most long-term thinking of all like the most like rooted in understanding that like we're in this for the long haul and we can't just focus on like what's in front of us right now and I do think that that has to do with like when you've been traumatized, especially in a systematic way, mm-hmm. it just doesn't work anymore to have like a miracle cure, fast acting solution. It just doesn't work. It's the same thing. Like you can't take a pill for racism. Like we all wish we could, but like that's not how it works. And when something is systematic in this way and the problems are in the, the root system of what's going on, you have to have a different way of thinking about it that's this more cyclical long-term like over over the thinking about things as like being a a much longer collective journey over a long period of time as opposed to something that we do today for a 10-day course of taxi cycling (laughs) or whatever exactly yeah and I'm so terrified to say this because it's such a nuanced trend that I'm seeing of, of discussion about shamanism mm-hmm. and indigenous alternative, more feminine forms of medicine. Um, that's really been 
co-opted in a certain way in the last couple of years, especially by um, white white women like me, um, white people, <laughs> white people who stormed the Capitol and called themselves a shaman. Um, that, but, but I'm terrified to say that actually that has been the thing that has helped me the most is paying women of color who are, I'm, I'm sad that I'm afraid to say this because it's so stigmatized in colonized Western society. To, it's just written and trained in us to delegitimize alternative forms of medicine that don't have double blind studies behind them, but there's a reason why they don't have double blind studies. Right. Funded. That's not their fault. You guys yeah. are the ones that design and conduct the studies, like design and conduct the study. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, so it's not going to be as money making as we're, mm-hmm. yeah. But I, I, I think that there's such an interesting like divide happening in so many ways and the spiritual wellness communities Mm -hmm. this like this the nuance of yes there is a mind body connection too has been such a mind game for me I (laughs) cannot tell you because I it's like okay maybe it's not it's like yes we can change like we can will ourselves to think positively uh, and then maybe miraculously my cancer will be healed if I have cancer, Mm -hmm. but like, also there can be just like a sub it's subconscious too. There's a lot that is like possibly energetic and subconscious that we don't understand about the human brain gut connection and uh, about Mm -hmm. the nervous system and just humans don't understand these levels yet. And so then we're like, okay, well, it's the mind then then you need to like try harder to think positive thoughts and don't like talk about your illness anymore or yeah it's just so so, but it's been so helpful to me to do brain retraining programs and trauma healing and working with naturopathic shamanic healers to do hypnotherapy and past life like that's i i did not believe any of that stuff before Mm -hmm. I was, you know, up to the corner and there was nowhere to turn but that. And then it just mm-hmm. completely helped my symptoms. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I'm scared to talk about it because we are going to be, oh, we're already delegitimized and told that we're crazy, but you mm-hmm. know, that's kind of part of racism is like, yeah, the, oh, the, like the indigenous medicine couldn't possibly work. They don't know what they're doing. I'm always shocked when like doctors that I know that think of themselves as like progressives, but they are so wildly xenophobic about types of medicine. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. (laughs) You don't see that that's racist to just off the bat say, no, no, no. All of those things from those other countries without me even having looked at the data, it's all bullshit and it's all lesser and it's all inferior. You don't that doesn't set off at trip wires <laughs> in your brain that like there's something wrong with that. Like it, it's fine with me to do, to, to c- because I, as you were saying, it's a very nuanced conversation because there's an enormous amount of bullshit in the alternative healing community, especially where it's been co-opted by white people essentially. <laughs> like, like that just is true where it like gets and it's not just white people, but I mean, predominantly, like where it gets kind of twisted and taken away and made into, again, what I always say is it kind of gets taken from its roots and becomes sort of shrunk down, whatever it is, whether it's yoga or um, positive thoughts or whatever it is, gets like shrunken into a new miracle pill. That's like, just take these positive thoughts and call me in the morning (laughs) or take these, whatever, whatever it is that gets sort of reduced into a new type of Paxil or whatever it is. And, and that that is, is wrong. And it, and it, again, it sort of resists like, cause the brain retraining and positive thinking is such a good example of this because very clearly stress and stress in particular has an outsized impact on the like exacerbation of symptoms for people like you and me like somebody with cancer when they're stressed they don't get like like wildly sicker overnight that's not 
what happens. It might negatively impact their disease progression in some way, but it's not the same as like when somebody like you or me has like a really stressful event or somebody dies or something close to us, it is you, you be, your illness goes just completely <laughs> down the drain and like you or your, your health does rather. And it's so, so stress and the way that stress impacts our disease is very real and clearly has something to do with the development of the disease in the first place. And mitigating that and doing all of these things that are sort of modulating to our stress response clearly helps. And with some people, it provides remission. Like some people really do. I know a couple that like did brain retraining and they just rode off into the sunset and that's fantastic. <laughs> but it, it to take those stories and say, and therefore everybody is, if they would just do the same thing, they, if they just thought more positively or if they just excavated more of their trauma or their personal history or whatever, that they would get better. That can, in my opinion, especially with this type of stuff, can be so damaging because it's like it starts to set up another dynamic where it's all your fault, where you you did this. And if you don't get to the bottom of whatever emotional problem that you have, then that's your fault that you didn't get rid of your shame or your, your grief or your rage or your whatever it is. And I, so I, <laughs> I'm like a huge proponent of like, brain retraining and of trying those things and and of developing other less difficult ways like you know transcranial magnetic stimulation you know like different things that are sort of you know emerging that maybe people could do that would be not quite as difficult as like a 100% excavation of your entire psyche because <laughs> that's like really hard <laughs> and but but really useful and it's just again it's just that nuance of like okay how do we provide structure and support around these things that we can clearly see help some people without poisoning that person against themselves for the rest of their life like thinking that that they are the cause of all of this in a different way than they've been told by regular medicine, but now by an alternative medicine practitioner who definitely doesn't know what they're talking about. They don't know. I mean, they might know, they might have seen so often those alternative health practitioners, especially if they're just like, I don't know, our friends who have gone through a certification training or whatever, they've just read a book about it or they've just done a retreat about it over three weekends in January, <laughs> that is not enough to tell, to convince somebody that they are the cause of their own illness. Like that, it's just to me, I just feel like there need to be better guardrails kind of set up that's like, okay, so this is kind of the wild west. It's a lot of different things that, <laughs> that help a lot of people. We want to try to help you explore what would be the most helpful for you. But if it doesn't work, it's not your fault. The practitioner is not going to blame you. You shouldn't blame yourself. Like, and then beyond that, trying to understand, well, why do all of these things, why, do brain re, why does brain retraining work for some people and gut healing work for other people? How can those things be connected? And they obviously are. The gut brain access is like a really well understood phenomenon, but that's not the way that it's presented that it's like okay so in some people maybe that the brain side of it is more predominant because of their genetics and because they did have a tremendous amount of trauma and whatever and then other people it's the gut side of things because they were on antibiotics for a year or whatever and so just like having like a better global understanding of kind of how all these things fit together um so that you can help people in a way that's not causing further damage and is also not like sawing a hole in the bottom of their wallet where money just <laughs> falls out forever. <laughs> yeah, it's so inaccessible. That's the, the other part that I talk mm -hmm. about. I just, it's yeah. so not affordable. It's, and I partly moved to California so that I could work with this doctor in Ojai who went to Harvard and Dr. Robin Bernhoft and he, you know, was a top, like doing some residency in London and um, was a top surgeon and MD. And then he 
got exposed his um he says that he thinks that he got sick because he was dealing with so many toxic livers and organs um mm -hmm. in the surgery that he his theory is that his liver got overburdened by petrochemicals mm -hmm. and so he says most people with chemical sensitivity and environmental illness just have overburdened livers among other things so that we can't tolerate any like our immune system and everything develop like an exaggerated response to every little exposure to petrochemicals that are in like old spice for example we're really coming down on old spice not going to get a sponsorship um but i wanted to work with him and like he was great and he recommended brain retraining among other things to detox mm -hmm. my liver but it was going to cost it was eight hundred dollars for this first appointment mm -hmm. and then what he wanted me to come in five times a week for infrared saunas and all kinds of ivs and mm -hmm. that's going to be thousands of dollars every month um, and I was li living in the back of my van <laughs> and like unable to get income because I was too sick to like lift my head most days. So you can't like get money to pay for that. So that is the conundrum for so many people. And that's part of the reason why it's so important that we need to change this conversation and the stigmas and the misunderstandings so that it can become more affordable for people to get at the root causes or at least have palliative care. Yeah. I actually think there's an opening here. I mean, probably not for the more, probably not for like infrared saunas, but like for like mm, just basic wellness stuff. I actually think that there's, uh, because the insurance system is so overburdened by illness, they're the ones that have to pay for it, right? It's extremely expensive for us to be sick. Um, I do think that we're, we're having this alignment where like the interests of like David and Goliath are like actually aligned for probably a brief period of time, but I can see, and I've been following this, that, that it, it does seem like insurance is, is on the precipice of starting to cover, you know, integrative healthcare, uh, uh, maybe like fruits and vegetables, like vouchers for fruits and vegetables. You know, if you can cut a coupon out of your local newspaper to present at your grocery store, you can definitely get a coupon from your Care First or from Aetna or whatever to present at your grocery store to get, you know, to make um, healthy food be more accessible, all, all these kinds of things. And, and you know, to have probiotics covered and to have, you know, all, there's a million things we could put in there. But I think that, because they've done some studies on this actually at Aetna, again, the head of Aetna got sick, <laughs> fell down the rabbit hole and was like, wow, this is so fucked up. <laughs> and he went, he got better because he like saw a naturopath and did all this stuff and came back to Aetna and then and was, was like, and none of his treatment had been covered by his own insurance company that he was the president of. And so he came back and he conducted a study at Aetna, that was 3,000 Aetna employees, and they they covered like their naturopath, their yoga, their gym, their all this all the wellness stuff, and like productivity went up by like 3,000 percent, and rates of illness went down by like a factor of 10. Like it was like very dramatic, <laughs> and he was like, and so he's be I don't know I haven't looked at this in a, in the last maybe like two years, but he. He has become like a big proselytizer for, it's kind of what you were doing to lobby um, Congress people on their own self-interest in dealing with this thing that they think is not in their self-interest, it actually is in their self-interest. And the same is true for insurance companies. If they can reduce disease rates by a factor of 10, that is an enormous savings for them in terms of like the amount of money it costs to cover a naturopath and like a gym membership <laughs> or like fruits and vegetables or things like that. But the cost of compared to like, if you looked at your and my insurance, like if you just tallied up everything, all the tests, all the doctors that you and I have been sent to go do, what they cost without insurance, like they cost us like a copay and, and often a lot more than that, but without insurance, I mean, it's like 
probably in the millions of dollars. It's a ton, a ton of money, if, especially if you've got a lot of surgery. You could avoid so much <laughs> of all of that. It's not just for the mystery illnesses, but for all chronic illness. If you just genuinely aggressively incentivized people to do wellness stuff. It's not enough to offer like a $5 rebate, like if, you know, <laughs> which is what they're doing now. They're like, you can get $5 off your $675 <laughs> monthly payment. If you check in with us and tell us that you're tracking your sleep and getting your 10,000 steps in every day and eating healthy. And I'm like, you guys <laughs> just cover it. Just just radically cover all of the stuff, the fitness trackers, all the stuff, and you will see compliance go way up. Not everybody, but a lot, a lot of people, I think, will start to adopt those behaviors. They already are. Like I'm sure you've noticed, like that the wellness is like metastasizing. <laughs> it's like it's everywhere now, and it's good, but it is sort of. It's strange for me to see wellness reach a lot of my healthy friends before it even reaches like my chronically ill friends <laughs> yeah. um, and, and be sort of co-opted by, by them. I'm like, okay. But all of these companies, if you look back at the stories of where did X, Y, and Z wellness company, they're all started by Womies and <laughs> Momies, <laughs> all of them. They all are people who had these specific problems. They got really into wellness that got them better. They started a company around it. And so it's now it's interesting to see like, a lot of my friends that were so wellness skeptical are now kind of like, oh yeah, it's always, I've always <laughs> been into, I've always believed that sleep really matters and that stress is something that I should think about seriously and and I should eat healthy and all this stuff. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you made fun of me <laughs> for those things, not five years ago, <laughs> but I'm glad to see it being adopted. That's good. <laughs> Mary's life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, I, I'm happy to see it be adopted. But I, it's the same thing in regular medicine, like we're seeing with long COVID. All of a sudden, you're seeing a lot of prominent doctors be like, well, this looks to us like MECFS. And I'm like, well, it looks to me like that's the first time you've ever said MECFS <laughs> out loud. <laughs> you should probably apologize. You should probably talk about that before you talk about that this is MECFS, like you have to talk about why there's no treatment for these long COVID patients. Like that's your fault. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway. Even though yeah. I'm glad that they're talking about MECFS, I'm just like. <sighs> I know. Well, speaking of MECFS, I don't want to take too much of your energy. <laughs> and I feel like we could talk forever <laughs> because I really, I mean, we. We didn't yeah, even, so much in <laughs> we didn't scratch the surface of all oh, I know. <laughs> similarities. And I'm really curious specifically about what, you know, with the, the pelvic stuff, because I, I had a resurgence of that last year that was a nightmare and uh, really, <laughs> there are a lot of people who have similar health stories, but I don't actually talk to a lot of people who have like specifically the when <laughs> like the pain um yeah. and ability to have sex etc like so that's that's yeah. something that you know i wish was talked about more and that we had a brochure that could be handed to it at least like if you have an sti or something this is how to deal with it and talk with your yeah. partner yes yeah, exactly <laughs> good support from your partner and from other people because it's like it's one of the more debilitating things, even in the in the world of pain. Like I always say, I'm like, people are like, well, I have pain too. I've got some back pain. I'm like, no, I also have back pain. Back pain and pelvic pain are different in the same way that like back rubs and sex are different. <laughs> like they're really different types of nerves and 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 concentrations of nerves it's just completely different and so don't tell me your back pain is the same unless it's a really good back rub <laughs> yeah unless it's a really good back that's true <laughs> um but well i'm happy to talk to you about that like even in that because i do know a lot about <laughs> pelvic pain uh if you want to maybe not for the podcast but we'd be happy to 
talk through kind of what stuff that you've tried and ideas like with that if that would be helpful yeah and maybe we should sing together someday yeah. too. <laughs> oh, i would love that yeah and i just i i love that um we have similar uh come to similar conclusions that a way forward can be that this is in the self-interest of CEOs and people who it's their job to seek profit and it is gonna profit everyone in the long run and medium run right. to just be looking at things holistically and not just the whack-a-mole game yeah exactly Amen. <laughs> yeah. so I'm so so glad that we finally that we connected and you know, jumped on it once Philip made the connection. Thank you so much, Phil. <laughs> yeah. He's a lovely person. I don't know him that well. I just know him through my friend Kelly, but he seems just like the most lovely human being. Yes. And so talented, so sweet. Yeah. There, there are a lot of people who, you know, just listen to our stories and are like, I believe you and yeah. oh my gosh you know give you that satisfying reaction and I'm thankful well, for that. yes he's one of the few people that like he like reached out to me and was like how do I buy your book a lot of people have done that that are friends of mine especially men but it's more it's less it's more for show <laughs> and like it's like but he was I was like oh you don't have to do that like you can wait till the paperback comes out it's kind of expensive right now because hardback and He's like, no, I'm, I'm gonna order it. I'm gonna order one for me and for another copy for somebody else. <laughs> and like, I really want to read it. And I was like, you are such a nice person. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hope that you rest well. I mean, we- Yes, I'm gonna go do that now. <laughs> we'll talk, talk again, but um, yeah, got to take care of ourselves in this yeah. wild time and um, look forward to being in touch. Okay, I'm so glad to meet you and thank you for telling me your, your no good, terrible story. <laughs> you too. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm really glad to be in touch. Okay, thank you. Take care. bye, Sarah. Bye.